Well, if we listen closely this morning, some of us can probably still hear the echo of chapel bells ringing in our ears. And if we look around, we can probably spot a few people who stayed out a little late last night, and we can't spot others who are sleeping in this day. The photographers, musicians, and DJs in our church family are especially busy right now, and many of us are trying to decide just what to wear and whether we can wear the same thing two or three times over the course of a summer because it is wedding season. Our sanctuary flowers this morning, you'll notice, are given in celebration of a wedding that occurred 50 years ago as we acknowledge the 50th anniversary of Robert and Alice Angel, an anniversary that I understand they share with Sandra and Chris Knipe and maybe some others in this room, these couples celebrating five decades of living out the promises made to God and to one another at their weddings. I think you'd agree that those kids are going to be just fine. It's what we hope and pray for our own Dixon Cruz and his fiance Sarah. Facebook tells me that Dixon, who just a few weeks ago was gracing us with his talents on our organ, proposed to Sarah just yesterday morning and a December wedding is planned. And then last night in Asheville, Adriana Massey, daughter of Sarah and our former pastor Ken, was married to her husband Kyle, beginning a life together. And we can imagine for them the sanctuary flowers that might appear decades from now. Well, on a personal note, this Thursday marks 15 years since Jenny Schiraus and I were married. Now, if that number shocks you, that's what happens when you get married about five minutes after your college graduation. It means that you become an old married couple at a still relatively young age. And it also means that our memories of that day are still very fresh, from the prep to the service to the friends and family that surrounded us, and of course, memories of that reception. The reception was held down the road from our service at the local Presbyterian church, mainly because we wanted dancing at our wedding reception. (laughs) And at that time and place, some Christians didn't dance, or at least they didn't allow dancing, including the Baptist churches of our youth in Lakeland, Florida. And so we twirled about the floor of that Presbyterian social hall, accompanied by jazz standards and encircled by people who had been so vital to our lives. And at one point, we stopped in the middle and we just looked at it all. And we promised one another that we'd always remember that moment those people, that first dance. Well, in some ways, today is about a marriage. Trinity Sunday, as it's known in our Christian calendar, reminds us of the joining together of these three parts of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, united in our Christian theology for better or worse for 1,700 years now, that God is not one, And God is not three in some confounding, glorious mystery that exists ever beyond our best attempts to conceptualize and understand it. Somehow, God is one and three. It was on Trinity Sunday two years ago that our inquisitive son, Jack, at that time five years old, was peppering his mother with questions about this God and three persons that he had heard about in church And Jenny did her best to respond, doing about as well as any of us might. And finally, Jack sighed at her replies and he said, Yeah, that sounds made up. (laughs) And you know, our young skeptic might have been on to something, or at least justified in that line of questioning, because Trinity Sunday is the only day in our church calendar where we are called first to consider not a teaching of Jesus, but a teaching of the church. The word Trinity never appeared in the Bible, and we wouldn't expect it to. It derived from early Christian efforts to make sense of what they read in Scripture and throughout their own experience of the divine in the world. 
And as the early movement of Christ's followers organized and became a church, with that, some teaching and some theological identity started to coalesce and form, and there was a mounting sense that God existed not as singular and static, but in multiple ways. Like in the first chapters of Genesis, almost every line is astounding and inspiring, but in the midst of the story of God's good creation is a statement that seems to interrupt and expand who we understand God to be. Verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1, let us create in our image Yahweh, the Lord, God, twice using the plural pronoun, precisely in this moment of creating humankind in the divine image. Let us create in our image. Well, it's the same image of plurality and relatedness that we hear as the risen Christ prepares to depart to the Father, but first commissions His disciples, those eleven and all of us who have followed Him since, in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptized in this way, He says. Go forth in ministry and mission with this as your image. And Paul uses this language as he blesses the church in Corinth. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And by the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea, there was this growing consensus that God was not a me, but an us. The image of the one who formed the church and sent out Christians was multiple. Father, Son, and Spirit, three. The Trinity is a mystery, not a puzzle. So says the Latin American liberation theologian Justo Gonzalez. He goes on to say that you try to solve a puzzle, but you stand in awe of a mystery. And those early Christian ancestors of ours, they stood in awe, just attempting to take it all in and reckon with this teaching. And some of them came to embrace it with a particular indelible image, a word that actually came to them from Greek theater, the word perichoresis. Peri, meaning around, from where we get the word perimeter, and choresis, from where we get the word choreography, dance, dancing around. God, like a circular dance, they conceived. God, as the flow and the swirling between these three, Father, Son, and Spirit. God, as a constant movement of love flowing in and around itself, and then finally outward to draw all of us in. And this image has led contemporary mystic an influential writer, Father Richard Rohr, to describe the Trinity in a recent book as the divine dance. And it's there from the very beginning. God swirling, moving above the waters and creating humankind. And then this same dynamic, loving God, moving in the lives of every one of us and sending us out in that same movement, empowered by the Spirit to call others and draw others back into that flow. And sometimes we forget the dance and our refusal to serve God or our denial of our community that God offers to us. We've been stumbling and tripping over the steps ever since the garden itself. But through the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, we are always invited back in. As Father Richard Rohr has said, God is not a dancer. God is the dance itself. And yet still, so many Christians don't dance. Which is to say, so many of us believe in God without any evidence of the relationship and the unity that exists within this triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. The theologian Karl Rahner, writing in the 1960s, once produced a classic study called The Trinity, in which he says that Christians are in their practical life almost mere monotheists. That is, if Christianity ended up dropping the doctrine of the Trinity, he suggests, the day-to-day -day lives of Christian people would remain largely unchanged because so often our lives bear no evidence 
of this community that we see in our God in three persons. We don't operate with this sense of interrelatedness that testifies to this creative God who binds us all together in love. We so often live more like as though God is one. As though God is individual. Because if God is one, then we can more easily operate that way ourselves. We can more easily be one. We can be individualistic and isolated and cut off, looking to our own interests above all else and set on our own achievement with no thought of others. And we can participate in that exercise throughout the whole of Christian theology of deciding who is in and who is out of the circle as though such a practice is within our capacity to discern. If God is one, then we can stress not relationship, but exclusion. But God is not one. And so maybe sometimes we'd rather God be two. Because if God is two, then we can operate that way. We can live as though we are two, which is to say we can operate with a dualistic understanding of the world, an oppositional approach where we are locked in struggle and competition, a simplistic either or with everything placed in easy pairs that define each other and are ultimately defined by and against and over and under each other with an element of power so easily introduced. And you can recognize that kind of thinking in our world. It's the kind of thinking that divides us, it separates us into categories. And I wonder if that kind of oppositional either-or understanding is part of why that indelible image that Jenny and I carry of our wedding day is full up of people who look mostly just like us. Because if left to my own devices, my life is constructed that way. And I wonder if our failure to embrace a God as three might have something to do with the anger and the bitterness that separates us into easy split screens and polarized politics. And I can't help but wonder if that kind of competitive approach might have something to do with the somehow always mounting disparity in our world, or if that kind of simplistic either-or understanding of things might have something to do with our incessant struggles with racism and discrimination and all of those overpowered, oppressed, and wounded even to this day. Because instead of the mysterious, awe-inspiring dance of the Trinity, we so often simply create God in our own image as the one in Anne Lamott's phrasing, who loves what we love and who hates what we hate. You see, we come to understand God so often in a way that fits within our limited human capacity for love. When God is calling on us to join in with the movements of the divine and participate in how those movements can change this very world. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was caught up in the dance years ago as we can see throughout his career of seeking justice and equality of resisting division, especially during the deepest, most devastating days of the apartheid in South Africa. In those days, Nelson Mandela was in prison and the only voices left were those of church leaders bold enough to speak like Desmond Tutu. But he had become a target for silencing and intimidation. And the government had canceled a political rally, and so he decided that he would hold a church service instead. Everyone gathered at St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town with troops massing by the hundreds outside, intending to intimidate and threaten. And finally, some of them poured inside, and they lined the walls, and they were writing down, recording everything that Archbishop Tutu said, but he stood up boldly to preach. And that's when he must have sensed that the movements of this God in three were movements in his life too, because he stood and he proclaimed that this apartheid would not endure. And as the troops jotted down every word, in one extraordinary moment, he pointed his finger at those enforcers standing along the walls of the sanctuary and he said, you are powerful. You are very powerful. But you are not gods. 
And I serve a God who will not be mocked. And then he flashed that wonderful Desmond Tutu smile and he said, So brothers, since you've already lost, since you've already lost, I invite you now to join the winning side. And at that, the congregation just erupted. And do you know what they did? They started dancing. They started dancing right there in the church. And then they started pouring out of the church and dancing out in the streets. And Jim Wallace, who was there observing this remarkable moment, said that it was astounding that these government troops moved back because in Wallace's words, no one had any idea what to do with dancing worshipers. I suppose this world doesn't have the first clue what to do with Christians who dance like that, do they? With those who move freely in the name of love, who give up deciding who's in and who's out, and who join instead the circling movements of the Trinity, recognizing that this life of God is in their very life, that they are called to take it on, that they are called to pour out and display it to the world. Last weekend, many of you know that I had the opportunity to spend 48 hours in New York City for the retirement of Reverend Ronnie Adams, a good friend and mentor in my life whom I served with during my four years at Metro Baptist Church, and who for 22 years has served as a missionary in New York City with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, largely serving as a pastor to the HIV AIDS community. Now, Ronnie is not a dancer, but his friend Milton is. Milton moved to New York some years ago to pursue his dream of becoming a professional dancer, becoming a backup dancer to Madonna and to several other famous pop stars throughout the 80s. But his health began to wane by the late 80s after he contracted HIV. And last weekend at Ronnie's party, Milton was among the speakers and he leaned on his cane a frail and tired man appearing much older than his 40-some years. But he described to us how he first met Ronnie when years ago, ostracized from his family and wondering about his future, he attended one of the weekly church services that Ronnie led at the local AIDS ministry, Harmony House. I'd always known that Ronnie went to Harmony House on Sundays because he would come by Metro, sometimes grab a bagel, spend time greeting the folks, sing the first hymn, and then when we were greeting one another, Ronnie would quietly slip out the back, walking the ten or so blocks down to Harmony House. And I always assumed it was so he could preach before a crowd of hundreds gathered in rows in that community room to listen to his powerful witness but I never knew what Milton described to us, how every Sunday, Ronnie would enter that community room at Harmony House, and from those rows of chairs, he would pull out six, seven, eight or so chairs, and he'd place those in a circle, and he'd sit down with his Bible, and every Sunday, he'd wait for his congregation. You became my pastor, Milton said, with tears in his eyes. And that circle, he said, that circle became my church. And it turns out that Ronnie Adams is a dancer after all. As any of us are when we join the circling movement of God, when our movements are free, when our welcome is clear, when our relationships are equitable and just, when our lives reflect the life of God. My friends, Scott and Audrey, are the kind of Baptists who dance, and they did so years ago at their own wedding. Scott, who is the pastor of First Baptist Church of Christ in Macon, Georgia, and his wife, Audrey, had grown up together in the same home church in Charlotte, and so their wedding was full of their church surrounding them, former Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and older adult mentors and long enduring friends it was a beautiful occasion for them and that next summer when Scott and Audrey were home staying with her parents for a little while they got a message on the answering machine from one of those fellow church members and wedding guests his name was John Spikes 
an eccentric and gangly gentleman who loved to run and was known affectionately to most everyone by the nickname Spike. And Spike said on that answering machine how glad he was that Scott and Audrey were back in town and that he wanted to wish them a happy anniversary here one year later. But as he continued, he thanked them for inviting he and his wife, Yvonne, to the wedding. Yvonne was one of those former Sunday school teachers in attendance. And after a long battle with cancer, she had died not long after Scott and Audrey's wedding. And Spike shared words of gratitude with them, with Scott and Audrey, for all of the wonderful memories that their wedding had provided for he and Yvonne. Because their wedding celebration was the last time that Spike and Yvonne appeared together in public. It was the last time that the two of them ever had their picture taken together. And as he went on, he described how it turns out that that wedding was the last time that they danced. And Scott smiled as he remembered Spike's words on that answering machine years ago. And he said, and here I was thinking that my wedding was about me. Because it's never just me. It's always, always us. We who are created in this image. We who are commissioned in it. It encircles us. It sweeps us up. It sends us out. So let us brothers and sisters, let us go out dancing. Dancing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.